Hello and welcome to lesson four of the Colored Gemstone Academy on my YouTube channel, Paul DC Gemstones. Now, if you watched lesson three, that's when we introduced you to the concept of what is a colored gemstone. And we also did the first of the four C's, the color, cut, clarity, carat weight. So this is actually, even though this is lesson four, consider it almost part two of the four C's because today we're gonna to talk about cut, specifically, how the gemstones are cut, what shapes should you be looking for, is it an oval, is it a round, is it a square, is it a round brilliant cut, is it a marquise cut, all of those things are going to be answered as we go through this lesson. But first, I wanted to remind you <clears throat> some ground we covered before, that diamonds are evaluated very differently than color gemstones. I, I talked about how a diamond cutter is actually called a diamond cutter, whereas someone who cuts color gemstones is called a lapidary. Well, that comes to play in our discussion about cutting gemstones as well, because they have a completely different philosophy. When you are cutting a diamond, you're looking to return the most visible white light back to the eye, that dispersion, that sparkle that you look for in a diamond. Whereas, like everything else I talk about with colored gemstones, it's all about the color. So we're going to talk about cutting, and we're going to also talk about how the cut affects the other C's, the color, the clarity, and even the carat weight. So that's what this discussion is gonna be all about. So first, let's talk about diamonds. Diamonds, again, it's about the white light, it's about the dispersion, and it's all about the proportion of the cuts, the ratio of the cuts, and the finish of those cuts. And in fact, it might surprise you to know that we did, the round brilliant diamond or the American cut diamond wasn't invented until the turn of the 1900s. Uh, and it was developed by a mathematician. We'll talk about that when I show you individual cuts and how many facets they have. But in the case of color gems, once again, it's all about color. So how does cut affect the color in a color gemstone? Well, how you cut it can affect whether it's lighter or darker. For example, a cutter might cut something a little bit deeper to retain more color and it would look like a darker color than it actually would if you cut it shallower. Now again conversely if they cut it shallower it's a great way to lighten the stone that might otherwise be too dark. Uh, and especially when you start talking about some specialty stones like a tanzanite or even a um, well tanzanite is a perfect example. It's what we call a pleochroic stone. When you get a piece of rough of tanzanite and you take a look at that in the sun and you look in one direction, it might look more purple. Another direction, it might look more blue. And still a third direction, it might look brown. And that, in fact, zoocyte, which is what tanzanite is, quite often looks brown in the rough and then they heat it to get, bring out that blue color. But it also takes a very skilled lapidary, someone who cuts colored gemstones, to orient the stone and cut it in such a way to get the maximum of that blue color because that's the one that's gonna command the biggest price. And in the gemstone business, it's all about your price per carat. It's all about the yield from the rough that you get. So that's uh, a great example of how cutting can affect, especially a pleochroic stone. Now, how does cut affect that other C called clarity? Well, that's another great and, and really interesting lesson because what you're looking for is the least number of visible inclusions in a stone. You want it to be a very, very clear stone. So when they're evaluating that rough, if they're looking at, and maybe it could cut a, a 10 karat stone, but it would show a lot of those visible inclusions, they might work around that stone and say, we're gonna make this a six karat stone because we can cut away these imperfections and get a higher price per carat on the stone that we ultimately do cut. So, so Number one, eliminating inclusions or clarity characteristics altogether would be a great goal. But it also, how they orient the stone might be able to hide or disguise some of those visible inclusions or clarity characteristics in that stone. So again, that affects, so cut affects the color. It affects the clarity of the stone. And while you wanna have a very skilled gem cap cutter or lapidary, and thirdly, okay, what's the other C? Well, that's the carat weight. Well, carat weight 
is very important to anybody who's in the mining business because that's ultimately how you get paid. Do you have, uh, you want to get the most yield out of the rough to make the most money. So actually, I'm going to be teaching you a little bit later on in this lesson how you can maximize the carat weight of a stone or make a stone look appear to be larger and maybe be a better value for your customer. So you might want to cut a wider stone to make it appear to be larger and then everybody wins. You know, the, the consumer gets a great value. You get to use more of the rough in a, in a way that you can sell more stones. So that's kind of how the cut aspect of the four C's can affect every other one of those four C's. But now we're going to get into some more nuts and bolts when we start talking about the individual cuts and how many facets each of them require. Well, as we continue our lesson on cuts, the second of the four C's that we're covering in the Gemstone Academy, I thought it'd be fun to go through probably 15 or 16 different types of cuts that you might commonly see your gemstones cut in and maybe find out why did they come up with that cut? Is there certain cuts that work better with different gemstones than others? Why were they developed? What's the advantages? What are the disadvantages? So I'm going to do it in alphabetical order, but with one exception. And by the way, alphabetical order, and then I'm going to show you a graphical depiction like of a, a diagram of what those cuts look like. So we're going to start with the cabochon. As I said, we're not going to go other than this, it'll be in alphabetical order. The cabochon cut is really just basically a flat slab with a rounded top. And that was really what I call the first cut. If you think about back in the days before there was any science of gems, they would just take a stone and polish it. And even in the Taj Mahal, back in uh, India all those years ago, they, they would have these gemstones literally just polished and then stuck into the wall. And of course, looters came and started to dig some of them out. But that's really the first cut. But it's also a very important cut still to this day because there's certain gems that just are much, much better with a cabochon cut. And one of those examples is something that's one of my favorite gems to do, and that's um, opaques. If you think of a lot of your opaque gemstones, whether it's turquoise or um, uh, black onyx, things like that, generally they can just have a rounded top and a cabochon and do just fine. The other uh, reason that the cabochon is the only one for certain things, like if you wanted to get something like a star sapphire or a star ruby, that is a phenomenon called asterism. It gives you a star. So a corundum has six rays, uh, six sides to the, fat, to the stone. And so that's how you get six rays of the star. And only in the cabochon are you able to get that, that asterism that you're looking at. And opal is another great example. I mean, I love to do opals. But a way to display that play of color is really, really, really important. Or if you're thinking of something that shows chatoyancy, like a tiger's eye, you know, that cat's eye effect. Generally, that kind of oval cabochon is the best way to achieve something like that as well. So I call it the first cut because it, goes, it dates all the way back to the Judaic and the Greek empires and the Roman empires, you know, 800 BC to 145 BC and beyond. So that is why I wanted to cover that one first. But now we'll go in kind of a little bit of an order and talk about the facets and maybe what are the advantages and disadvantages of those. So we're going to start, and I, again, I'll have a graphic on top of each one as we do it. Let's start with the Asher cut. Now, the Asher cut was developed by the Asher brothers in Holland in 1902. And back then, it typically had 58 facets, you know, give or take, and it was considered to be a hybrid of the princess cut and the emerald cut. So anytime you have something that is that step cut, a lot of times it's a really great way to show off the clarity. If you have a gemstone with great clarity, anything with a step cut, and I'll talk about that with each one that we get to. But in 19, oh no, I'm sorry, 2001, the family modified the original Asher cut and they went from 58 facets to about 74 facets and they made the corners a little bit wider so it was not like a cut corner it was like a soft corner so um, that was that's the Asher cut and then we get into 
the baguette cut. Now the baguette, as the name implies, is a longer, thinner step cut. So kind of named after the French bread, the baguette, that long uh, loaf of bread. But like any step cut, and the baguette has about 14, fa oh, I should probably mention facets. You know, when you think about facets, that's that kind of each face of the cut is going to be a facet. And it's, it's gonna reflect those different points of light or color back to the eye. So that's why we call them facets. But anyway, the baguette 14 is, is another step cut. So if you have something <clears throat> that, and I'll talk about that in the emerald cut too when we get to that, but um, it, it's a great way to show some deeper colors. It's also a great way to show clarity in a stone. That was created in the 1920s and 30s, you know, the Art Deco and the Art Nouveau periods. Then uh, they, it's one of the ones I really, really like, and you don't see a lot, is the briolette cut. And the briolette cut has no table, has no pavilion, the pavilion being the point on the bottom, the table being the biggest facet on the top. Um, it doesn't have a table, has no pavilion, but it has 84 triangular cuts in the briolette cut. So in, a, in a, like a shape, a, a pier drop shape of earrings with a briolette cut or even pendants like that can be absolutely spectacular because you have those facets, 84 of them going in all these different directions. And that was developed in India in and around the, the 12th century. And it's generally regarded by lapidaries as the most difficult cut to achieve. And we talked about the cabochon and that would be next alphabetically. And then there's the cushion cut. Sometimes it's called the old mine cut or the European cut and that had 64 uh, facets and it looked they called the cushion cut because it looked like if you look at couch cushions it kind of looked like a couch cushion kind of a uh, a rectangular uh, cut like a pillow and that's why sometimes it's referred to as the pillow cut and that has 64 facets interesting to know when you think about the old mine cuts and the you know versus the modern round brilliant cut um it's and we'll talk about that when we get to the uh the brilliant cut but that was developed as you know some of the old diamonds that were old mine cut actually showed different colors almost like a prismatic effect but that's not what we what we want in diamonds today what we want in diamonds today is the maximum amount of white light and dispersion and sparkle coming back to the eye now we get to the emerald cut and and i really like the emerald cut especially to show off any colored gemstone. Number one, you have to have great clarity in a stone to stand up to that emerald cut. Because if there were any flaws or inclusions in that emerald cut, it would become glaringly apparent. Now it also, there's a reason that it's called the emerald cut. Because when I, and, and I talk about this in my book on gemstones, I talked about how emeralds are evaluated differently than most other gemstones. Most other gemstones, when they're talking about clarity, you know, you're looking for something to be, um, have completely no inclusions under 10 power magnification. That's considered to be a, a fine and a very clear stone. Emeralds are evaluated differently because emeralds routinely have inclusions that are visible to the naked eye. And if you ever found an emerald that was really, really clean and really, really care, you know, uh, clear, they would want to showcase that in that emerald cut. So that's how it really got the name, the emerald cut. That has about 50 uh, facets and it, has, it is the best way to showcase clarity as well as the color in all gemstones, but in particular for the emerald. And then we get into the uh, an, a romantic cut and that's the heart cut. You might think about that for Valentine's Day. The international symbol of love being the heart. Well, the heart cut was developed. It was basically a pear shape, and then they they put a cleft in it, and so it resembles a heart. And it has so think of it as a pear cut with a cleft, and it's uh, 59 facets in that one. I don't know exactly when that one came to being, but um, I, I think it's it's advantages are very very obvious. It's a very romantic. Uh, gesture to give a gemstone and something in the heart cut. And we're going to continue on and learn some of these other cuts, why they are so important for that magic word for a gem miner, yield.
Stick with All right, moving right along as we continue in our discussion of different shapes and cuts of gemstones, we're going to move on to the Marquise cut. I know a lot of people say Marquis. I was always taught very early in the gem business that, and in the diamond business, they're called Marquise stones, not like Marquis de Sade. But anyway, tomato, tomato, whatever you like. But the Marquise is that long slender pointing on each end, sometimes referred to as a navette, but for me, the navette shape was always a little bit more elongated than the typical Marquise. Generally, it has 57 facets in the Marquise. And what it does, the advantage of that, is it creates the illusion of a larger stone. So for example, if you're shopping for an engagement ring. Now, of course, engagement rings don't have to exclusively be diamonds, but let's use diamond as an example. A longer marquise on your finger would be very, very flattering. And even though it may not even weigh as much or be as expensive as the round cut, um, it would look like it's a lot bigger. So that's one of the advantages of, of having uh, the marquise cut. Now the octagon cut, and of course, octagon has eight sides, and you're going to see really pronounced sides on the corners in that um, graphic that I'm showing on the screen. And like all of the other step cuts, it has that advantage of A, showcasing clarity. If you have something very, very clear, those step cuts are great for that. And again, I don't think say this just with emeralds. I love to find a great garnet, for example, a spectacular color, and do an emerald or an octagon cut to really showcase the quality of that stone. Now the typical facets on that are 53. So again, showcasing clarity, but also if you have spectacular color, the octagon, octagon cut will be a really, really nice choice uh, to showcase that color. And then we get to the oval and the oval cut. Now we remember the oval shape was introduced back in the Greek and the Roman times we talked about earlier for cabochons. But as far as a faceted oval, that was really became prominent in the 1950s, 1960s. It has 69 facets generally. By the way, when I talk about the number of facets, it's always kind of give or take <laughs> on that. But that would be about 69 facets. The other advantage of that, once again, if you have the oval on your finger, now usually the, the ovals are set east-west on the finger, but they can also be set north-south. Again, the illusion of a much, much bigger stone for the money in an oval than perhaps you would see in the typical round, brilliant cut stone. Um, so the pear cut, sometimes called the teardrop cut, great for earrings, obviously. That's the hybrid of the oval and the marquise cut. And because of that, it has a little bit of a different number of facets than the oval. It actually has 71 facets in the pear shape. And I think that that's a great... Um, just a, it's a, I think it's great for earrings. It's great for pendants. I almost prefer those to almost any other shape when I'm designing jewelry to go with the pear shape for earrings. It just seems to be such a, a natural. Then we get into something that has become really, really popular. Probably, when did the princess cut come out? I can't, I can't really remember that off the top of my head. But the princess cut was a square version of the round brilliant cut and it can range anywhere from 50 to 144 facets now why did the princess cut become so popular well it was a take a square and, and make it as brilliant as a round brilliant cut it's going to be certainly very appealing but there's another reason why it really became popular and this is why i said it kind of blows your mind remember we talked about yield when you when you are mining gemstones and i buy stones in the rough my question always is going to be, what is the yield? How many carats of stones can I get? Because when I'm pricing something and I pay, let's say in the heyday of Sleeping Beauty turquoise, for example, and if I'm spending uh, back then $1,500, $1, dollars 2000 a pound for that Sleeping Beauty turquoise rough, how much yield am I going to get? Because all that cost has to go into each and every stone that I sell or, or create in a piece of jewelry. So here's what blew me away. When you're dealing with diamonds, and that's really what the, you know, the princess cut was uh, designed for. It was all about the yield too. When you have a piece of rough and you're making a round brilliant cut, you are cutting away a lot of that rough stone 
to create the shape that you're looking for. Most of the guys I talk to who are in the mining business say, if you could just let us, especially in turquoise, if you just let us cut and maximize what we can get out of the stone, we're all going to save money because we're using much of the stone and not wasting so much. But of course, we in the shopping channels always want to have, you know, this shape or that shape to satisfy all the customers out there. In the square, the, uh, the, the round usually only retains about 50% of the original rough of the stone. So you are literally wasting about half. Now they might take some of the extra and try to make little baguettes out of it or something like that. But the round retains only about 50% of the original size of the rough. In the square, cutting it in the square retains about 80% of that original rough. Now the translation to, to that is you should be getting a better value because you're getting a bigger stone for the same money than you would get had you decided to go with that round brilliant cut. So it's better for the, for the diamond cutter, it's better for the jeweler, and it's better for the consumer, believe it or not. Uh, then we get to the radiant cut created by Henry Grossbart in about 1977. So if you take that princess cut and combine it with a cushion cut, that's the, um, that's the radiant cut. So think about uh, as of a cushion cut with more spectacular facets on it. I guess that's the best way that I always described it over the years. Um, that's about 62 to 70 facets. Um, and then, then we get to the round brilliant. And this is, this is really interesting. And the round brilliant cut, which is sometimes called the American standard cut. And I mentioned back in the day, even with diamonds, people were getting the old mine cuts or the European cuts. And then you saw, you could see literally prismatic colors of the rainbow coming out of the diamond. And people thought maybe that was really sexy, but it really took a mathematician. In 1919, a guy by the name of Marcel uh, Tolkowski, he was a math mathematician. And he figured out those angles and proportions that I talked about when we first started this lesson in cut on how to return the most white sparkle back to the eye. That's what you're looking for in a diamond, absence of color. In colored gemstones, of course, you're looking for something completely different. Color, color, color is the most important thing. And um, so that's the, um, the round brilliant and about 57 facets in the right pro 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 proportions, in the right shapes, and that was the the father of the modern brilliant or American standard cut in diamonds. And this is another one interesting historically to me, the trillion cut. So the trillion cut is, a tri is triangular in shape. And it was developed in 1962 by Henry Meyer Diamond Company. And this, this comes back to the days when I first got into the shopping business in 1989. I remember when we had trillion cut stones. So think about a trillion is a triangle shape, but sort of puffed out on the sides. So kind of a fat, a fat triangle. Um, and back then, early on, because it was developed by the Henry Meyer Diamond Company, they had trademarked the name Trillion Cut. And we couldn't use it on the air when we were talking about it. We, we were uh, not selling it. And lo and behold, because we were not educating people on the shopping channels about the Trillion Cut, well, they weren't selling all that well. So they kind of re reduced that restriction. We could start talking about the trillion cut and we sold a lot of them. And I think everybody ended up being happy about that. And then the final cut that I want to talk about is, is kind of near and dear to my heart. It's called the Portuguese cut. And the Portuguese cut has a, a ridiculous 161 facets. And I'll never forget the very first time I showed one on the air. It was in Las Vegas. I was working for Shop NBC or Shop HQ at the time. And I had this wonderful, I think it was a 10 karat round uh, Portuguese cut stone. It was spectacular. It was a great price and it sold out in seconds. One of the things I noticed about that cut you have to cut that one a little bit deeper to get all of those facets in there. And it just reflects spectacular sparkle back to the eye. But it was funny because I, I had what was a um, 
what I would just call the Swiss color. But because it was cut deeper, it was almost more like between a Swiss and a London blue topaz with that incredible sparkle. And it's something that I don't do all of the time, but when I do, I think you need to pay attention and you ought to own at least once in your life uh, one of those Portuguese cut stones. Well, that's gonna really do it for our lesson on cut. I know it was a little bit probably more technical than some of the other ones that we're doing, but I think it's important that you understand some of the shapes and what they can do for you. And stick around as always, we're gonna do something at the end of this lesson. And I think what I'm going to do this time, I think it was at the end of lesson one, we, we went to the amethyst mine and showed you where the amethyst comes from. I might revisit Brazil at the end of this lesson and show you a factory, how they process that amethyst once they take it out of the mine. All right, I will see you all a week from today when we will give you lesson five, which will actually be part three of the four C's. So we, we already learned about the color and the cut. And next we're going to talk about the clarity. See you all then. Thanks for tuning in. If you like what you're seeing, remember to hit that subscribe button and right next to that, you might see a little bell and that will give you notifications when the next lesson is ready to view. Thanks for watching everybody. Hi everybody, thanks again for watching lesson four of the Color Gemstone Academy. And as promised, I'm now going to take you in to a working amethyst factory. Now the first thing you're gonna see is I'm gonna introduce you to my friend, Greg Genovese, and he's gonna tell us how in the heck do we get these huge thousand pound geodes out of the mine and to the factory? Take a look. I'm back here with Greg Genovese, the laughing Greg Genovese, and we are at Northern Amethysta de Sul, actual Genesis. This is one of the most important amethyst processing plants in the entire world. Now we've learned, we've taken them into the mines, we've shown them how they saw these things in half, I forgot to ask you the most important question. Look behind you. This is a an enormous, and it's not even the biggest I've seen. How the heck do you get something this big and this heavy out of the mountain? Because I was there. You have to stoop over to walk through that thing. You ready for this? Yeah. Manpower. It took 12 guys. 12, two days. 12 big guys. 12 big guys. Two days to take this out and put it on the flatbed truck inside the mine very carefully. Some of them used nylon straps, but they picked it up and brought it in to this location. Were you just flexing for the camera? Yes, I was just flexing. <laughs> I wasn't there. Well, there you have it. Obviously not one of the big guys that brought it out, but at least he knows where it came from. There you go. <laughs> okay, so now we brought that geode back from the mine and we have it in the factory. And what you're looking at now is the gem cutter is going to take a look inside using a light at the end of a pole and see, inspect it in every which way for color. Is this something that's gonna be an amethyst? Is it something that we're gonna to put to heat up to become citrine? That's when we make this determination. Now you'll see him carefully look inside again on this particular geode and he marks it with a chalk line. He wants to make sure that he's gonna maximize the color that you see when he cuts it in half because this is probably gonna be used for ornamental value only, not for gem quality. Now we take it over and we put it on the saw. And that's what you're looking for. And I, I muted the sound for you because it's just a really, really loud sound. That's why he has the headphones on for ear protection. And he's gonna cut it down right on that chalk line. And then when he's done with that, they will open that up and you will see, we're just about almost through that the whole way. And now uh, we'll have a little bit of the factory sound coming on now. And this is what it looks like when you split it in half. Now that's gonna be a lot of dust and residue from the saw. And the next step is, well, that's a power washer. We're gonna take the power washer. We're gonna clean all of that up so we see exactly what we got. And as we said, most of these are gonna be ornamental. They even make tables out of these things. They make, you know, a lot of things, but here's the, finished color. Look at how spectacular that is. And I was blown away to find out that this really didn't have a lot of gem value, what they're sh showing here. And that's what this next Greg's going to talk about right now. I, I do have a question though, because a lot of people look at these geodes and they wonder, will somebody actually take them and make it as a fashionable material or is it really just for display? No, good question. These particular geodes are just for ornamental value. 
Only 2% of the geos that have amethyst in them are good for fascinating. Only 2%? 2%. Wow. Because yeah. so if you look at all this, you think, wow, there must be so much amethyst, but not much of it makes it into the